What's going on YouTube, it's Tej back again with another video and today coming back at you with another two round NFL mock draft. This week we return to the with trades edition. So excited to round out the 2023 calendar year with one final mock. And actually on that note, just want to say thank you to everyone who's you know subscribed, viewed, viewed uh, videos throughout the year, commented. Uh, this has obviously been the biggest year of growth on my channel and now we're like 40 subs away from 3,000. I know not the world's biggest milestone, but a milestone for my channel, none the least. Uh, so, uh, nonetheless, so thank you all so much for any engagement, whether it's subscribing, liking, commenting, all that stuff throughout 2023. It's been awesome to see this channel grow, and it's been awesome to see regulars in the comment section. It's also just been cool to see it get to a wider, wider reach and see people that I haven't interacted with interact on these videos. And, you know, maybe this is the first time you're seeing a, a video on my channel. Definitely hit that subscribe button. 2024 is going to be more of the same, actually. More of the same, but better. Uh, I'm just getting better and better with each video I do and uh, trying to find more and more content and produce it in a way that is uh, digestible and enjoyable for y'all. So uh, 2024 is going to be the best year of this channel yet. But all that said, let's go ahead and jump right into the meat and potatoes of today's video. Of course, this 2024 NFL mock draft. And we start with a bang. The Chicago Bears. This is going to be a mock I've been talking about doing for a while now um, where I don't have Chicago take a quarterback. I have them trade down. So I'm going to have the Washington Commanders. Uh, I was actually spending um, Christmas with uh, a Commanders family, a uh, family full of Commanders fans, uh, as I butcher this trade. It's going to be a first this year, a third this year, and then a future first. Uh, make it go through. It's a little more value, but I have free-for-all trading on. So this is about right when it comes to draft tech and what it should be. And, you know, it might end up being actually more. But I was with uh, Commanders fans when uh, the Patriots won that game that slid Washington to the number three spot, and everyone was very, very happy with that. But here I have Josh Harris, you know, new owner, looking to make a splash, doing just that. Takes the number one overall pick, selects Caleb Williams, someone who's had, you know, a ton of hype, a ton of love throughout most of this process. I know of late, it feels like Drake May's really kind of gained a lot of public and kind of consensus love. Um, he's my quarterback one, Drake May, that is. I know he's, he is for a few other people, and it feels like the wider public's kind of getting there, but you really can't go wrong with either one of these two guys going one and two, and that's really kind of what needs to happen. That's why if Chicago's going to stick with Fields, they're trading back because Caleb Williams, Drake May is going to be one, and then the other one's going to be the number two overall pick. Speaking of that, let's just get right to it. I have the New England Patriots moving up to take this number two selection off of Arizona's hands, and it's going to be the same package. Third this year, future first. It could probably even be more. Um, but again, just trying to go off of what Draft Tech says for value. Patriots, they get their quarterback in the future. So Washington, the need's obvious. New England, the need's obvious. If you've watched these teams, it makes a lot of sense. And for Washington, you know, with them benching Sam Howell, I think it tells me everything I need to know about where they stay on him. They've seen enough. They understand he's not the guy of the future. They're going to turn over to Brissett so they don't get totally embarrassed by San Francisco and Dallas, but they need a long-term guy. So that's what we give them in these mocks. And then for Chicago, I mean, this is what Bears fans have been saying in my comment section forever. Don't need a quarterback. We'll make it work with Fields. He's getting better. Give us Marvin Harrison Jr. to partner up with DJ Moore. Another year of growth from that offensive line that is still very, very young. And then we'll see what they do with OC, Luke Getze back for another year, third year it would be, uh, or you move on and try to find a potential upgrade there. But adding MG, M MHJ plus DJ Moore, two bona fide ones for Justin Fields, that's an ideal situation. Now you got to figure out what that contract's going to be for Fields, but man, that does make his surrounding ecosystem a whole lot better. And then we get to Arizona here at uh, the number four spot, and I'm actually going to have Arizona trading a ton ton throughout this mock draft so this will be a common theme but I uh, wanted to play around with you know the Jets moving up and taking Olu Fushano here um, and ultimately what we're going to have them give up is this year's third and then next year's third as well um, and then you know at this point the Jets have you know I don't wanna say they've sold their soul per se but also when you make the move for Aaron Rodgers you know you've kind of already done enough to say that you want to win right now so what's one more move right so a third this year a third next year and you go ahead and land the best pass protecting left tackle in this year's draft class which obviously if you've watched the Jets this year, you know that offensive line is brutal. Um, Mikai Becton, I think, played pretty well and has played pretty well this season. Um, obviously, injuries have come up towards the latter half, but I think if you give him like another year at right tackle, hope he stays healthy. Olu Fashano, plug and play left tackle. And then you have ABT, ideally on the inside, can kick out to play right tackle if Becton does get hurt. Much better situation. And if Rogers is going to come back next year, which he has said he is, you need an elite blindside protector. So that way, something like what happened week one, freak incident for sure, but hopefully something like that doesn't happen again. To the New York Giants, Malik Neighbors, man, I've seen the comps already, and I, I've said it multiple times on this channel. I'm not huge about comps. Um, to me, I, I think it gets... It, 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 it paints the wrong picture for a lot of people who don't really know what a, a, a really good comp is, so I, I just tend to stay away. But, man, the Stephon Diggs 
comparisons are definitely there. Like, and I mean, that's just that's all I see. Every time I watch him play, it's just like, man, this is like the second coming of Stephon Diggs. So this is kind of the one guy where I'm like, yeah, I'll stick to it. Um, and man, give Brian Dable, you know, his you know Stephon Diggs in New York sounds ideal. We saw what that did for Dable with the Giant, or excuse me, with the Bills. Um, and I think if you add a clear cut number one, Wandell Robinson on the slot, Hyatt as the field stretcher, we'll see what they do with Waller this offseason. You add a clear cut number one, and it makes the rest of that wide receiver room fall into place. This is going to be a mock where I don't go quarterback for the Giants. Them and then uh, the Saints, man. Just the the cap situations for Jones and Carr. I, I just couldn't make it happen in this mock. Maybe I'll do it in a future uh, video, but both those guys are going to be really hard to move off of this upcoming season. Now, that being said, I, I do have the Denver Broncos taking quarterback. Spoiler, wants to get there, and they're, they're obviously willing to swallow that pill. So we'll see. Maybe we get more information about those two sides. But for right now, I'm just I'm not going to have them to quarterback in this last 2023 mock. Um, Brock Bowers then going to be the pick to the LA Chargers. They just need more receiving talent. Um, ideally, you get Keenan Allen back next year on an affordable number, probably on an extension. Mike Williams can somehow stay healthy. Quentin Johnson gets better in year two. And then you could add Brock Bowers as a Gerald Everett upgrade. And then we'll see what happens with Austin Eckler. But in reality, you know, Mike Williams can't play 17 games. Quentin Johnson hasn't looked great. Maybe he does get better year two. Um, and then Keenan Allen's probably back. Eckler's probably gone. So you're missing a decent amount of firepower. And uh, we've seen what this offense, you know, asked Justin Herbert to do with a lacking of firepower. Uh, and I think Josh Palmer's a solid player too. I want to throw that in there. Um, but I think if you get Brock Bowers, it just opens up for how much would you do over the middle of the field. Plus Kellen Moore, think about his time in Dallas, used the tight ends a ton. Maybe Dalton Schultz a big time name right before he left um, to go to Houston and Moore got this job here in LA. So I could see him doing a whole lot more and then honestly elevating into another level with Brock Bowers. All right, on to the Tennessee Titans. Real easy one here, Joe Alt. I mean, whether it's been Andre Dillard at left tackle or the you know kind of turnstile of guys that have been at right tackle this year, Tennessee needs an upgrade at both sides. So Alt, plug and play, stick him at left tackle. Awesome. Partner him up with Peter Skaronski on that left side of the O-line. Feels awesome. Uh, not only from a pass pro standpoint, but those two guys are awesome run blockers as well. How many times can I say awesome when talking about this pick? But that would really pave the way for Derrick Henry, Tajay Spears running left side. Um, or you could try to flip him over to the right tackle side if you want to give Dillard another shot or if you think, you know, Jalen Duncan's going to be better in year two. And I think Alt's more than technically refined to be able to do something like that and switch positions. So love this pick. It makes a whole lot of sense there for Tennessee. We're going to have back-to-back -back edge rushers come off the board here at eight and nine. But first, we're going to have Chicago trading back and it's going to actually uh, give us a quarterback. Then we're going to get to back-to-back -back edges. So um, that gives it away a little bit. But I'm going to have Atlanta move up from 10 up to 8. And they're going to give up the second of these third-round picks that they have. And the pick here, Jaden Daniels. I, I mean... I have been noted on this channel to not be the, the a very big believer in Desmond Ritter. Um, I think this year it's just kind of back that up. And Taylor Heineke basically has played football in which he's not trying to lose games. And that has been an upgrade and elevated that offense, including, you know, last week against the Colts, who I think have a pretty good defense. So tough there. And I think Jane Daniels can be the, you know, just basically an upgraded Desmond Ritter. You know, a little bit more processing building. Um, I think he can get the ball out a little bit quicker. Certainly did so far in college. Um might be even better athlete. Might have even more arm strength. You know, I just think, again, it's kind of like Desmond Ritter across the board, just a little bit better. Uh, so would absolutely love this uh, for the Atlanta Falcons. And then we'll see what happens with Arthur Smith. But if he's still there, I think he could do a lot with Jane Daniels. Now, hopefully, he just really buys into, hey, B. John Rob Robinson's a good football player. Drake London is a very good football player. I'm going to put the ball in their hands. All right, now let's get to this aforementioned uh, little bit of an edge run here inside the top 10. I'll have Jared Verse be the first edge off the board. To me, right now, I think he's edge one, man. He closed out the season really, really strong. Arizona could use a dude there on the edge. They've got a couple guys who have okay and kind of taken steps forward uh, young in their career. Dennis Gardak's giving you decent production, I guess. But they could use like a double-digit sack guy and kind of like the receiver conversation. When you have a dude, you have that clear-cut star-level guy, the rest of it all kind of falls into place. And I think the Cardinals could have that with Jared Verse. And then to the Chicago Bears, I'm going to have him take Dallas Turner. Ultimately, it wouldn't shock me if Turner's the first edge off the board just because he's so explosive and he's added a little bit of muscle. He's added the inside counter, so he's kind of like Nate Wiggins in a regard where I talked about him and he's just getting better and better. Every time we see him, he's just getting a little bit better. And that's kind of been true for Dallas Turner over these last two years. We see the athleticism and now he's getting better and he's showing refinement. That's going to be really, really alluring to a lot of NFL teams. So it wouldn't shock me if ultimately the order's flipped here and it's Turner going nine versus going 10. But either way, love the fits for both those teams. And I think they got two awesome edge rushers in the mix. Uh, and then I pick 11. Again, I thought about going quarterback here. Trust me, Saints fans, I hear you. Derek Carr has not been good. I totally agree. Maybe you can make a change at OC and just elevate him. But he's he's got more than $50 million in dead cap next year. You, you can't move on from him. And given where you guys are in salary cap, like if you swallow that pill and move on from Derek Carr, you're already looking at a pretty tough financial situation to basically be 
giving up part of your salary cap for a guy who's not going to play for you. Like, I just don't think you have that type of flexibility. So it's probably going to have to be another year, Derek Carr. Maybe you could draft someone. I think this is a decent class full of developmental guys. Maybe you get someone a little bit later on. Um, also should be noted, I'm not going to have Quinn Ewers come off the board in this mock just because I think he'll go back to school. I do have McCarth come off the board, so I don't know. I'm kind of talking on both sides of my mouth. But we'll find out here soon enough. But Roma Dunze, this is just a Michael Thomas replacement, someone with similar size, similar physicality. Uh, but I think Roma Dunze brings more explosiveness, more downfield ability than a Michael Thomas has. Um, so it's almost Michael Thomas plus, a guy who wins at all three levels while still can be that you know physical, over-the-middle slant boy, if you will, uh, for this offense. And a running mate there for Chris Olave, that will hopefully go a long way to seeing what we can get out of Derek Carr in year two. To the Green Bay Packers, I love this fit with Cooper DeGene. And man, after watching the Bucks game and watching you know Chris Godwin rip them alive, I mean, Joe Barry's got to go as DC. He just plays too soft a coverage. Like I can get behind the too high philosophy. Trust me, I think I would do the same thing, but yeah, can't play that far off. They give up way too much underneath and they have constant coverage miscommunication. So Barry's got to go. But man, if you added Cooper DeGene to play the slot, keep him in the box, let him be a good tackler, take away the middle of the field throws, that inside receiver if you're playing man, like that could be a really compelling addition that secondary that being said if they also want to go outside corner and that or maybe that's where they think Dejean can play that also makes sense because I'm assuming Jair Alexander is not going to be a Green Bay Packer next year especially after his suspension for what he did in Carolina so Jair's out maybe Dejean's playing outside I'd play him in the slot and then we can kind of figure out who's going to be on the perimeter uh, but that's just because I prioritize the slot a ton either way makes a lot of sense for Green Bay and like, let's just be honest they're going to go defense round one and then they'll swing back and maybe go offense sometime in round two that's just the Green Bay Packer way for the most part. Let me get to the Las Vegas Raiders. And now let's have some fun. We have a little bit of a quarterback run here. Um, you know, I think we got to the spot 13, 14, 15, where these three teams all need a quarterback for next year. And at this point, you didn't have to trade up. So why wouldn't you take the quarterback? So I'm going to have Bo Nix come off the board. He's my QB5. But man, I've been really impressed with what um, Antonio Pierce has done. And he's done that with Aiden O'Connell, you know, like 60 something yards against Kansas City, getting out of the W. And I think Bo Nix could be a guy you just plug in right away. And if you keep Devontae Adams around, cool. There's a target to take advantage. If you keep Jacoby Myers around, awesome. There's a number two. We'll see what happens with Jacobs. You know, I think he can guy. He can just be kind of the, the trigger guy. You know, kind of be the, the conductor to this train, um, which is similar to what he did at Oregon. I think he's got enough arm strength to play at the next level. Quick processor, a little bit on the older side. But if you're looking for a starter too, you know, I could see where the Raiders sell themselves on that being uh, a point of uh, interest and a reason why they take him here at 13. Broncos. I'm gonna go JJ McCarthy. Um, Easily could have been Michael Penix, but ultimately between these two, I think the NFL would lean towards McCarthy and the arm talent there versus the injury history that comes with Penix. I would obviously go with Penix. He's my QB3 just ahead of Daniels. Those two can be flipped any day. Um, I kind of go back and forth on it. Just depends on who you're looking for or what type of QB. Um, but McCarthy, you know, he definitely comes with the upside, has a, you know, flamethrower for an arm. He throws as hard as anybody in this class. That's kind of my issue with him. Not a whole lot of layered throws, not a lot of touch on his tape. Um, and, and also the fewest amount of passing attempts of anybody in this class played on a team that could win in a variety of ways. Like it, the burden wasn't on his shoulder. So um, that's something where if he did go back to Michigan, it'd be interesting to see how he handles that. Um, but if he does declare, because Michigan looks good in the playoff, you know, totally would make sense. He probably goes somewhere round one just off the arm talent plus mobility on top of that. Um, and then for Denver, man, I mean, sitting down Russell Wilson, I mean, just like the Howell thing, but this is way more, way more evident that they're, they're done with Russell Wilson. They're moving on. I have no idea where he goes next year. Maybe the team right after them. I think they're the betting favorites right now, Minnesota. Maybe they would check that out. But if, if I'm a team, I'm, I'm, I'm steering clear of Russell Wilson. I just, I wouldn't want to shoulder that burden. Speaking of the Minnesota Vikings, let's give them Michael Penix. I've said multiple times this channel, man, if Michael Penix can end up going to Los Angeles, depending on what happens with Stafford or Minnesota, depending on what happens with Kirk Cousins and that timeline, yada, 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 I would love that. Because he's got a situation now where he's got some good, talented receivers around him. Like, he's got three dudes that I really, really like. Jalen McMillian was a preseason honorable mention for me at my receiver rankings. Remember, Dune Day's been wide receiver th three for me from start to finish of this cycle. Um, and Jalen Polk is like, feels like a Chris Godwin type. We'll talk about him later on in this video, obviously. So I want to see him go to a place where he's got a couple receivers and like Minnesota, Hawkinson coming back off injury. Figure to see, you know, him be one of the best tight ends in football. Justin Jefferson, one of the best receivers in football, maybe the best. And of course, Jordan Addison, who looked awesome when JJ went down. So, you know, I think it's a situation that he kind of maintains a high level of talent around him. Um, also, he's a guy that plays with timing really well in that Washington offense. So I could see where Kevin O'Connell is comfortable starting him right away. And it's sort of, sort of that same stuff. Um, and part of the reason I like Penix is because he shows he can get the ball out of, the, you know, out of his hands quick and he can play within timing of his offense. A lot of quarterbacks out of college have these long times to throw and then it kind of 
bogs them down for the first half of the rookie year. I don't think that's going to be an issue for Michael Penix. And man, if the Vikings had Kirk Cousins, I mean, they're in the playoff mix, in my opinion. So if Michael Penix can hit the ground running, it's a team that definitely could be in playoff contention next year. All right, uh, to the Arizona Cardinals. But first, another trade for Matthiasen Forth and the Arizona Cardinals. Another small one here. I'm going to have Cincinnati move up two spots. Um, and... Basically, they're going to give up a uh, current fourth, throw in a future, uh, or actually a current fifth as well, just to make it perfect in a uh, draft tech system. And what I want to do here is I haven't talked about the idea of T. Higgins leaving, and I mean, I think that's a real possibility. Like, there might be someone who just forks over a bag that Cincinnati's like, okay, yeah, I don't think that's responsible to, to match because we got to pay Chase, we got to pay, you know, we just paid Burrow, all that sort of stuff. Not impossible. And right now they're paying Trey Henderson and, you know, uh, they're paying Orlando Brown Jr. And they're going to have a couple corners come off the board uh, or off the, you know, uh, salary camp with uh, Chidobe Wuzie and Mike Hilton hitting free agency this uh, this free agency period. But I don't know. Still, like, if T. Higgins is gone, like, this is as good an option to replace him as you're going to get. Someone with that same athleticism, same go up and get it ability, plays with that physicality. Um, you know, T, I think... He wasn't a great runner, route runner out of coming out of college, but you saw the change of direction skills. And over the course of his career, he's become a better route runner. So that's also what gives me faith here. Like, I don't think Keon Coleman's like the sharpest route runner in this class, but we've seen them work that magic with T. Higgins. Could he do the same thing with uh, uh, Keon Coleman here at 16? I, I think it's a really good fit. And obviously, these pre free agency mock drafts are really tough because I know there's Bengals fans typing right now, like, no way, we're not letting T leave. And, you know, hey, I would applaud you for that. That's it's probably a good business. I mean, it's probably a good team building decision in the long run, pairing him up with Chase for the long run. But you just don't know. Because T. Higgins has a factor in this too. Like maybe he just doesn't want to be the number two anymore. Like no matter what Cincinnati offers, he might just say no. You know, so it's, it's impossible to predict. So I'm going to go Keon Coleman here and just kind of play with the contingency idea of like maybe T. Higgins leaves and they're looking for a replacement. Moving up two spots to get Keon Coleman, I think that's about as good as you can do. To the Pittsburgh Steelers, let's go Nate Wiggins. I mean, this team definitely needs another corner. Guy who's got man and zone experience. Pittsburgh this year has played more man coverage or up there and towards man coverage. Uh, top 10 in the league. But that still is like 40% of the time. So, you know, you need a guy who can play both. Uh, love the athleticism. Love the size. Love the arm length for Nate Wiggins. And he's just a guy who's gotten better year over year at Clemson. I can really buy into those dudes who are on that upward projection. Uh, upward projection. Um, and, man, I just hope Pittsburgh makes a first-round investment at that position because... Pat Peterson honestly might be a better safety than any other corner <laughs> at this point. And, you know, Levi Wallace, great story for how he got to the league, but he's just not an NFL starting caliber, like number one corner. Um, I think Joey Porter Jr., get rid of some of the handsy penalties against him. He definitely could be. Partner up with Nate Wiggins. Now we're talking. All right, now we get to the Arizona Cardinals. They're picking here at 18. I'm going to go Terry and Arnold. I'm going to actually have him be the first Bama corner off the board. I think that's a live possibility. Really comes down to, do you want the smaller yet shiftier guy who can play inside and out? And to me, I think Arnold's actually going to be slot only at the next level. With I don't say slot only. He could play outside, but I'd prefer to see him in the slot with that change of direction skills. I think given where a slot receiver, they have the whole field basically in front of them, you know, not hampered by a sideline directly next to you like if you were playing on the outside. I want Arnold's change of direction skills to be able to match that from a receiver in the slot. So that's where I'd play him. But again, I, I prioritize that position more than most. Um, and he, I mean, you're just looking for a dude in that Arizona cornerback room. Like who's, I mean, Garrett Williams is a guy I like a lot, but not a first rounder either. So um, even if he didn't get hurt last year, he's probably somewhere in that round two conversation. But, you know, Williams, high-end athlete, Arnold, high-end athlete. That's a, that's one hell of a way to kind of build your cornerback room from the ground up if you're Jonathan Gannon and Monty Austin forth. All right, on to pick 19. Uh, I'm going to go with something that obviously contradicts my board. I'm going to have Chop Robinson go off the board before Leatu Latu. Leatu Latu is my number two edge. And it's, and it's close between him and Dallas Turner, you know, because I get the athleticism and stuff you can't teach with Turners there. Um, Leatu Latu is just so refined, though. So I don't know. I go back and forth. But I can see where in this situation, Chop or Leatu Latu, I can see where Tampa Bay and the NFL as a whole was just like, give me the athlete. Are you serious? And, you know, 250 pounds, I think Chop's a pretty good run defender. I don't think he's too light. I think he's got a good size, good frame on him. Um, and obviously the explosiveness is there. Um, but they're going to have to teach him and they're going to have to kind of refine him from a pass rush standpoint. So is Joe Tryon Shane could the guy to do that? Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they keep Shaq Barrett around and have you know, kind of the, the veteran mentor both those guys. But we're seeing Tryon Shane could take steps in the right direction. And if they could do the same thing with Chop Robinson, that could be a really awesome edge tandem of the future. All right, on to the Indianapolis Colts scrum. Have Kool-Aid McKinstry come off the board. You know, with Juju Brents, you know, six foot four, awesome change of direction. I'd just love to see them add another long, lanky corner. I played around with the idea of Quinion Mitchell here. But here, in this situation, Kool-Aid makes it to them, and uh, he's the best man press corner in this class. And that's just a skill set that, like, yeah, he may run in the four fives, but if you technically, if you're that awesome in hand fighting and getting receivers jammed at the line of scrimmage and you have that play strength, 
he kind of makes up for some of that. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, I think he has enough recovery speed. I think he's got enough makeup speed to where it's not a total liability um, against speedy receivers either. So uh, really like that fit. More length, more size in that uh, Indianapolis secondary, which would make for a really fun uh, defense moving forward if Indy did head in this direction. All right, to Seattle this round, I have Leatu Latu come off the board. I'm still a big fan of Boye Mafe. And, you know, I think Dar- uh, Derek Hall's been decent for a second rounder. Chenonowosu got hurt, though, and their pass rush has kind of taken a step down. Did extend to Chenonowosu. But, man, I just think in this situation, it's worth having the conversation of Leatu Latu, this NFL-ready guy, one of the uh, the most NFL-ready edge rusher in my opinion, him in verse, you know, falls in your lap at 21. Can you pass on this? Last offseason, you make the investment with Draymond Jones on the inside. You know, I think you could go, you know, someone like a Byron Murphy maybe to partner up with him on the inside. Devondre Sweat to sure up that run defense. Sure makes sense. But at the same time, you get Leatu Latu, plug him in a rotation with Boye Mafe, with Ochenna Nawosu, keep using him in unique ways. And then you factor in what you've already done with the investment on the inside. That would be such a scary pass rush to face week in and week out. Oh, and by the way, quarterback's got to get rid of the ball quick. And the guys covering those receivers are Devon Witherspoon, Reek Woolen, who I think long-term are going to be really big pieces of that defense. So um, I would just love its addition. I know a lot of Seattle fans don't love the idea of going edge, but let me hear your argument. If Leonti Latu falls to you, tell me why you would pass on this. Because to me, I, I think you'd be... You know, for lack of a better phrase, crazy to do just that. To the Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm going to have uh, Braylon Trice come off the board. Obviously, he's got a couple of big games, or at least one big game ahead of him uh, in the near future and potentially uh, another one thereafter. But, man, he's he's been the Washington pass rush for most of the season. You know, he does an awesome job turning speed to power. He's a little one note with that. But, you know, maybe that's just the one note you need. Uh, and especially when you plug him into this Jags defense. And assuming that Jacksonville extends Josh Allen, they work that out. You have the finesse, you know, specialist and Josh Allen, and then you speed to power guy on the other side, Braylon Trice, and you got Trayvon Walker in the mix. Like, that's a really awesome edge trio for the future. Well, I think Trayvon Walker's still got some work to do, but, you know, if he's kind of playing third fiddle, moving inside, playing outside, you're kind of moving them all over the field. I'm intrigued by that. I definitely am. So um, there's not a whole lot of places where I would say, hey, Braylon Trice, I'd give the green light for him going in the first round. But Jacksonville's one of those places because you got a dude, you got a stud in Josh Allen, and he's a perfect complement for what Braylon Trice and how he wins. So um, I actually like this landing spot a ton for Jacksonville. All right, then we're going to get to the Los Angeles Rams, but I'm going to have them first trade back with the Houston Texans, so the Rams are going to go from 23. Houston's going to come up from 27. Included in this trade, Houston's going to throw out a third, and then Los Angeles will chuck a five back to the Texans. And then here, man, with Titus Howard moving inside to play guard, right tackle's been an issue. George Fant, I don't think was great. And then something, I think his name's Howard Cheek, which honestly sounds like a makeup player from Madden. That sounds like somebody's pranking me. But uh, he's he gave up 10 pressures last week. He, he's just not been good at right tackle. So you got a plug-and-play Alabama product, multi-year starter from the Crimson Tide who has off-the-charts athleticism, um, great you know frame to go with it, more than enough play strength. Really, the only thing that kind of prevents this from happening is, does J.C. Latham really make it to 23? Feels like a little bit of a stretch. We had some of these right tackles fall. That's what makes it tough. Is you, know, you talk about these tackles and you get really excited about the two left tackles and the right tackles sometimes kind of fall out the back of your mind. Uh, and that's sort of what happened here in this situation. But you know, every draft kind of pushes guys down the board. So maybe it's the right tackle uh, trio here with uh, Latham, Mims, and Fuaga. But man, I would love this spot for Houston. Plug and play started there at right tackle. High ceiling. Partner up with Laramie Tunsil. Titus Howard stays inside to play guard. Uh, you worked out the extension with Shaq Mason. Keep him in there uh, over at the right side. And then uh, you just drafted a center last year and Jared Patterson out of Notre Dame. So it feels like, you know, with one more piece, that off the line, the next two years at least is set in Houston. All right, let's get on to Buffalo. Um, I'm actually going to have them trade back as well. And this time it's going to be um, the San Francisco 49ers as the team to come up. So from 24 to 31. And San Francisco is going to give Buffalo both a third and a fifth. And kind of the same thinking, you know, these right tackles fell on the board. And now I think we got into striking range for two teams that could definitely use an upgrade at right tackle and a long-term piece there. And for San Francisco, it's like you get to draft this uber athletic, great moving tackle um, who might honestly get drafted in the first round for his college football playoff game last year against Ohio State alone. He might go in the first round just from that game alone. Um, plug and play him at right tackle. I mean, that's that's an awesome, awesome addition there for San Francisco. And they may do with Colt McKivitz, but just imagine the ceiling that Mims has, what hap- what that looks like if they plug him into that. And then you have a tackle tandem of Mims with an abundance of play strength, awesome movement skills, and he's a monster build of a human being. And on the other side is Trent Williams, who you already run behind almost all the time. 
that that sets up for a really balanced and a really tough San Francisco offense to face. All right, now let's get on to Kansas City. I'm going to go A.D. Mitchell here. Uh, one, MVS's contract's very cuttable this offseason, so I think if you draft A.D. Mitchell here, you're definitely saving some money with uh, MVS being a cut casualty. And uh, honestly, I think A.D. Mitchell also comes with a little bit more yak ability than what would they do at an MVS. Um, I don't know. I struggle with this one because the Mecca Igbuka makes sense to me too. They're using Rasheed Rice more as a yards over the catch guy than a separator up until that New England game where you start to see him separate a good bit. Um, and if they're going to start using him more as like one-on-one man coverage winner, okay, cool. Then, you know, I think you can pass on Igbuka here, take the upside of Mitchell and have him do a little bit of everything. Speed size guy for sure and, and tap into that. But if you're not, then I kind of feel like you need a man coverage, you know, a, a guy on third and eight that can get away from his corner and get away from his assignment and get you the first down, move the sticks. And that's that's definitely something they're missing right now, a true separator. So Emeka Ekbuka was definitely definitely an option for me here. So could go either way. And ultimately where I had Ekbuka go, I wouldn't be hate I wouldn't hate if ultimately the roles are reversed and Ekbuka went here and Mitchell went there. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's get to Dallas here at 26. Boring as can be, but I'm gonna go Grand Barton. I think in this situation. You only got right tackles left. I don't want to flip to to leave safe for a while. I got to play left tackle. Uh, if I'm gonna draft him, I want to play him at right tackle. So I'm gonna have Grant Barton be the, the pick for the Cowboys. You plug him in at left guard, and then you hope this transition to left tackle for Tyler Smith goes smooth as Tyron Smith hits free agency. Um, maybe they'll just bring him back on a one-year deal and keep him as a starter, and they'll kind of just pass on this need for another year. Wouldn't surprise me. Uh, but also at that point, they might just go tackle sometime in the second or third, which is a contingency plan. Uh, but in this situation, I think Tyron Smith's gone. So let's go ahead and try to address that left side of the offensive line, whether a tackle or a guard. I think we have some flexibility given Tyler Smith can play either one for us. All right, let's get to the Rams here at 27. Let's give them a really nice athlete with great size and great tape to go with it, Kamari Laster. And those are all kind of things that I don't think the Rams cornerback room has at this moment, especially on the outside. Uh, I think this would be pretty much day one, their most talented corner in the room. And yeah, again, throw in there. NFL size and weight, arm length. Uh, he's done in the SEC too. So I just think this is a plug and play starter for the Rams where they desperately need one on that defense. They've been making do with Raheem Morris kind of keeping those guys clean, but you add this type of talent to it, you can do a lot more with it. All right, on to pick number 28, sticking in the cornerback room. Long-term corner is going to be an issue because, you know, Cam Sutton's three-year contract, but it's a one-year deal for Emmanuel Mosley. Um, it's a one-year deal for CJ Garner Johnson. And, you know, we're already at the point where it's like, hmm, Effective Melo Fonwu is kind of being used as a corner, kind of being used as like a safety, kind of being used as a pass rusher. He had two sacks last week. You know, like they're kind of using him in all a lot of different ways, which I, I kind of dig. A uh, guy I like to lock him out of Syracuse. I uh, liked where they got him in the third round, but they need like a, a number one, like outside corner of the future. And, you know, maybe they don't really need a number one because it's a good deep, it's a good offense. They'll put up a lot of points. They just need two guys who aren't going to lose them game week in, week out. Cam Sutton is definitely in that type. He's good enough to not cost you a game, but not great enough to like fetch $20 million in the offseason. And then you throw Quinion Mitchell in there, six foot two, 200 pounds, plays with awesome physicality, um, also a ton of ball production. It kind of sets up a situation where Sunt maybe gets the more speedy, agile, separator receiver assignment, and Quinion Mitchell maybe gets the biz- the bigger, more physical guy, because uh, I think that's where their strengths line up. So I love seeing cornerback rooms, edge rooms really get bounced out with guys who can win in different ways. So that way, no matter what you see in a week, you have an answer for it. So I love the addition of Quinion Mitchell here at 28, partnering him up with Cam Sutton. Feels like it, you know, steadies. Uh, uh, that secondary moving forward, play Brian Branch in the slot. Okay, I'm very good with that if I'm a Detroit Lions fan. All right, on to Miami at 29. I'm going to do the same thing I did uh, last week. Devondre Sweat, you know, this is a team built on speed, but, you know, I think they should pass on this one. Just draft the 360-pound monster to plug up the middle of that defense. And, uh, man, you know, Vic Fangio, his defense typically hasn't struggled against the run like a lot of his disciples have. But if Devondre Sweat were to make a team one-dimensional, against that defense that is naturally not going to give up a ton of big plays and features Jalen Ramsey and Xavier Howard at corner and Cater Kohu, I think is a lot better slot. Okay. You're going to create a lot of takeaways. You're going to create a lot of turnovers. If you're kind of sitting in pass coverage, waiting for it to come your way because Tavondre sweats taken away any ability to run against Miami. So it kind of feels like a piece that they're missing in the middle of that defense. Plus then it makes Christian Wilkins just kind of pin his ears back, focus on being a pass rusher. Let him be great at that. Just feels like it elevates that defense. This is the one kind of missing component. Plus, Devondre Sweat's a solid pass rusher. Like he, he, he was pretty good this year, and I think there's NFL potential for him to be just that at the next level. So, uh, yeah, just would be an awesome addition to that Miami defense. All right, let's get on to Philadelphia. This round, Talise Fuaga come off the board. Fuaga, I think, is going to test out as a pretty good athlete, but the numbers are definitely going to give us an answer to where if he's really going to fit with Philadelphia long term. 
Again, I think he's going to be like a solid, maybe a touch above average athlete, but he's definitely not going to be J.C. Latham and Marius Mims. Like, he's not going to be that special. Um, but that being said, also just throwing his tape at Oregon State, he gets quick out of his stance, um, and he's got an abundance of play strength, and he's just an absolute mover of people in the run game. So would love that, and it just kind of feels like he has the physicality and that mean streak to be a Philadelphia Eagle. It's just going to come down to, does he have enough movement skills to kind of fit into that blocking scheme? All right, on to Buffalo there at 31. Uh, obviously, you have Gabe Davis hitting free agency, so I want to go wide receiver here. And a name I haven't given them is Xavier Leggett. Could he be that physical receiver they don't really have right now? I think so. I know Gabe Davis could be a contested catch guy, but they really use him as like a field treacher, and that's about it. I think you can get that out of Leggett and also more yak ability than they're getting out of Gabe Davis here. So I'm really just trying to diversify this offense a little bit. Um, and also, you know, another spot where Ibuka could make sense because like, is Stephon Diggs going to be a Buffalo Bill next year? Like if they keep like not throwing him the ball, I have a hard time thinking he's going to want to stick there in Buffalo. I got a feeling that he's going to want to go to an offense where he's going to be utilized, something like Kansas City or, you know, something like that. But I'm obviously talking off, uh, you know, top of my head here. It's just something I'm kind of thinking about. You know, does Stephon Diggs want to be in Buffalo next year? It's not necessarily the sexiest place to play either. Um, so who knows? Maybe Ikbuka could be, you know, a Diggs replacement. But here, let's have Leggett be our Gabe Davis replacement, especially with his yak ability. Like, this is an offense under Joe Brady that's gone more of like, let's look underneath. And then when the chances are there, when there's an opening, we'll push the ball on the field. As opposed to with Ken Dorsey, it felt like they were always looking for the big shot and then checking down. Uh, so just two different ways to basically run the same offense. Uh, but if they're going to look more short to then go long, I think Leggett could add more to that offense than uh, Gabe Davis does right now. All right, last pick of the first round for the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, I'm going to have them go ahead and select another Texas interior defensive lineman, Byron Murphy. Kind of like what we did a little bit earlier on, kind of anticipating what might happen to free agency if Cincinnati loses T. Higgins, maybe they'll draft Keon Coleman. If Justin Matabuike, who, who's going to get an absolute bag this free agency, if he leaves Baltimore, this becomes a pretty pressing need, I think, on the inside. And even if you don't, like Byron Murphy and Matabuike as your pass rushers from the inside. Oh, and, you know, uh, Travis Jones there to be the two-gapping, no stack on between them when you're in base. That's an awesome defensive line. That is just straight up an awesome defensive line. And then you'll kind of pick and choose, find out what's going to happen alongside Adafi Owe at the edge rushing spot. Maybe David Ajabo comes back 100%. Love to see that. Uh, I just think Byron Murphy, man, this is honestly, and the reason, obviously, Johnny Newton didn't go in the first round of this mock. I, I just, at this point, I don't, I don't know why his team wouldn't draft Byron Murphy over him. He's, he's so much the same player. Uh, maybe Newton's a little bit better against the run. I'll give you that. But from a passer standpoint, I take Murphy. And he's also about 20 pounds heavier than Johnny Newton. So um, Newton's not going to stay on the board for much longer. Trust me, he's going to go on the board uh, and actually just two picks. But I think Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat at this point, I think have passed him uh, in my eyes, at least. And uh, if Matt Wiki leaves, Byron Murphy would be a really compelling ad as a replacement there in Baltimore. All right, on to the second round, Carolina Panthers. Let's give him a receiver here. This is where I have a Mecca Ekbuka come off the board. So again, if you know Ekbuka is the Kansas City Chiefs guy, you make this A.D. Mitchell, and basically he's just like a long-term at least you new know, DJ Chark replacement. Love that. I think either way can work. Uh, it's also going to be interesting to see because I think Carolina's got to sign a receiver in free agency, like a, a notable name in free agency, not like another Adam Thielen type, like a notable name in free agency, and then draft one too. And then, then you give yourself a chance, plus Jonathan Mingo, your second rounder from last year. Now you give uh, excuse me Bryce Young a chance to actually have some success. All right, got a trade here at 34. I'm going to have Arizona. Uh, stop me if you've heard me say it before. I'm going to have the Cardinals move back, and I'm actually going to have the Los Angeles Chargers move up just a handful of spots, throw in a fifth round pick to make it work. And this is where I'm going to have Johnny Newton come off the board. I mean, how many years now we talk about the Chargers having an inept run defense? And here we are once again talking about it all over again. So Johnny Newton, plug and play there at the three tech. And uh, also I think he does bring some decent pass rush upside to throw in with Tuli Tua Pelotu. And we'll see what happens with Khalil Mack this offseason. And I assume Joy Bose is back. Uh, but getting an extra pass rush type of threat in that defense would certainly go a long way. But this is a pick mostly made to shore up that run defense. To New England here at 35. Another receiver off the board now. Let's go Brian Thomas Jr. Long stride, six foot four. Ton of big plays on his tape. Uh, great vertical threat and also can go up and win in the air. Uh, just kind of a field structure that they want Tyquan Thornton to be, but I just never really thought he could. He's a track. He's track fast. I don't think it really translates to the NFL level because he's not always just going to run away from a DB. I think Thomas can do some of that. Not quite as fast as Tyquan Thornton, but he can be that deep downfield threat and has enough speed to threaten over the top, but does it with a lot more physicality and someone that if you're going to throw a 50-50 ball, Brian Thomas Jr., Tyquan Thornton, 
You're throwing it to Brian Thomas Jr. All right, let's get to the Washington Commanders then at 36. I'm going to have Patrick Paul be the selection here. Uh, I could see a world where, hey, we just drafted Caleb Williams. We need a left tackle of the future. Let's go get that plug-and-play, you know, battle-tested tackle from Houston with pterodactyl wings for arms. And, I mean, boom, there's there's your Patrick Paul. There's your left tackle for the foreseeable future in Washington. He's nothing special athletically, but very technically sound. He's gotten rid of some of the anticipate, anticipatory flag. Sometimes he guesses wrong and he would get a little grab. He had 10 penalties a season ago. Clean that up a little bit this past season um and i think with those the, that with that arm length he's going to have his fans and and people who will latch on to patrick paul are going to love this guy and he's going to be like their left tackle their under the radar guy not the obviously because everyone loves olu everyone loves alt and then you you know like my guy probably in the in the left tackle group is kingsley sua Montaia. a lot of people are going to latch on and patrick paul can be their guy all right, let's get back to Arizona. And I promise this time I'm going to actually have them make the pick. And I'm going to have a take a receiver here at the top of the second round. And it's going to be an interesting conversation in this draft cycle. Like, yeah, those guys at the top of the board are really special. But you get the late first, and it's like, mm, do I want to take a Mecca, Buka, Edie Mitchell? Or could I wait another round, get a Tez Walker, a Jalen Polk, a Troy Franklin? You know, something like that. It's going to be really interesting to see that conversation. Or who ends up being that fourth round snipe, that fifth round, you know, diamond in the rough out of this class. Who could be this year's Puka Nakua, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, but Tess Walker here, man. Size, speed, combination. Um, and he's also bounced around. He's done it at multiple levels. Looked good at Kent State. Played really well against Georgia. Back when, you know, that 2021 Georgia was the best defense in college football history. Played well against them. And did it for Max School, which is impressive. Also looked really good this year at UNC. And he once he got into the lineup, all of a sudden you see Drake May kind of having, like, 10 different receivers catch up on a given week to where it's like, it's a lot of Tez Walker and then there's a couple of complimentary pieces the rest of the way. And I think that speaks volumes when a guy can kind of just step into a situation and immediately be the dude for a quarterback, the guy he can lean on. I think this says a lot. And certainly here for Arizona, you're looking for a number one piece moving forward. Hollywood Brown's going to be a free agent. I think Tess Walker's got the chance to be that wide receiver one long-term, plus a different skill set than Michael Wilson who they drafted in the third round last year. All right, on to Tennessee here at 38. They have got to revamp this secondary. Denzel Burke's been awesome when he's been on the field this year for Ohio State. Got the size, got the arm length, got the athleticism. And this was kind of his prove it your Ohio State. Put it together. Uh, definitely think he should be somewhere in that top 50 mix. And to be honest, probably closer to the top 32 than top 50. So I think Tennessee gets a really nice value with him here at 38. To the New York Giants, another week where I'm giving them Taylor Guyton here or Tyler Guyton here at 39. You move Evan Neal over to left guard to me. It's just clockwork. It makes a lot of sense. Tyler Guyton, another guy who's really nimble out of his stance. Ton of explosiveness there. Greater in the run game uh, and also battle tested and pass protection. And he's held up his end of the bargain there. And by moving Evan Neal to play left guard, I think that alleviates a lot of the weaknesses he's had here. And at the worst, like you're at least trying something new at a position that's also a need at left guard for the Giants. So it's worth taking a stab at it. Let's get to the Green Bay Packers here at uh, 40. I promise you we would go offense somewhere here in the second round. We're going to have them back on the clock here in just a couple picks. Let's go to Jordan Morgan. Bounce back from the ACL injury. Really nimble on his feet. Um, height and weight's going to be an interesting kind of note. And then arm length with it uh, at the con line. But if he you know checks all those boxes, you know especially the arm length conversation, um, then I think this guy's going to be a left tackle at the next level. Um, and great mirroring ability. A lot of guys in this class that, you know, Morgan's not 6'8", like Sua Mataiha and like, um, you know, Olu Fashano at like 6'5", almost 6'6". He is six foot four, but still has that same level of like awesome mirroring ability. Where it's just like, I get it. You're not six eight, but like still six four at your weight. Like your feet should not move as quick and as nimble as they do, but they do. Uh, and I think this kind of lets you play Zach Tom long term at right tackle. I think Tom would be fine at either spot, but let's just keep him at right tackle. We draft toward Morgan, keep him at his native position at left tackle. Boom, tackle tandem of the future for Green Bay. All right, back to the Commanders at 41. Let's give him Jonah Ellis. Um, a little bit undersized. We'll see what he ultimately weighs in at the combine. That's going to be a big conversation. Right now, he's like six foot one and a half, 240, I think, on Utah's website. So uh, realistically, he's probably like closer to six foot, six foot and a half, 230. You know, so bulking up is going to need to be there for Ellis. But super quick out of his stance, a killer spoon move, great hand usage, a refined pass rusher, a refined pass rusher. So uh, considering Washington just traded their top two edge rushers this year, I think Ellis could be a guy who's plug and play starter for that defense. And then on to Philadelphia, JT Tuomelo, uh, I think a guy who can win with a lot of power. This makes a lot of sense to be that Brandon Graham replacement. I've mocked Braylon Trice here plenty of times for the Eagles to be that exact same thing, be that speed to power replacement for Brandon Graham. That's how he wins. I think JT Tuomelo could be the exact same thing. But this would be an interesting spot for him to go because we're talking about one of the highest rated recruits in 247 history. Five star, goes to Ohio State, and it just feels like he never got that killer streak. Kind of felt like he had the same Zach Harrison problem where it's like, you know, ideal size, 6'4", 270. And there's weeks where you look like an absolute unstoppable force. And then there's other weeks where you look like a very movable object. Like, it's just, 
I don't know. He, I go back and forth with him because you'll see a quarter and you're like, damn, that, that's a guy who should go in the first round. And then you'll you'll watch a game and you'll be like, wait, wait a minute. He was healthy, right? He's playing. So uh, if you could put him in Philadelphia, who's had a great track record of developing both sides of the trenches, this could be the best outcome for Tuamela. Like this could be the spot where he gets his consistency unlocked and turns into that highest time, you know, one of the highest talented recruits out of 247, true five-star type of talent. And he kind of flips that switch that we just haven't seen him flip just yet. Back to Green Bay, Cam Kitchens. This is simply too easy for me. Um, sometimes he's play a little Superman for Miami, but I also see a guy who, if you just you know, kind of have him reel back a little bit, he's playing center field at free safety, he'd be awesome at it. You want to play him in the box, he'd be awesome at it. You want to play him in the slot, he's fantastic at doing just that. He's already put that on tape at Miami. So a guy that wherever you need him, he can plug in and play. Um, and obviously here, we already took DeGene, so I'm kind of factoring DeGene's going to be the slot. Cam Kinch is going to be your safety of the future. And look, if John Alexander's gone, there's legitimately five starting spots in that secondary up for grabs next year. Maybe four, depending on how you feel about Eric Stokes. And can he play one of those outside corners? So, you know, for sake of argument, let's say Eric Stokes, former first round pick, Stokes is going to be one of your outside corners. There are four other, in my opinion, secondary positions up for grabs. So I don't mind double dipping here inside the top 50. To the Las Vegas Raiders, let's go Leonard Taylor. An awesome upside prospect to fall on your lap here at 44. This is one where you sprint the card in. Yes, he's a guy who wins with his athleticism and size alone. He won't be able to do that consistently at the NFL level because everyone's a freaky athlete with an awesome build. Um, but if he gets coached up, you know, that's when you're like, okay, he has that plus now that he's been refined, he can come along and be one of the, you know, major steals of the draft here at 44. Um, you know, Patrick Graham worked with Dexter Lawrence. I'm not saying Leonard Taylor's gonna be Dexter Lawrence or even Leonard Williams for that matter. Patrick Graham worked with him as well, but that type of relationship and saying, hey, these guys did this, you know, that 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 could certainly go a long way. And honestly, this could be a spot too where you sign a veteran and just let him coach up Leonard Taylor as well. So I uh, would love this. It's been a position of need forever now for Las Vegas. So really for the, you know, the Raiders franchise because it dates back to Oakland too. This has been a long-term need and I just love the upside value you could get out of Leonard Taylor. If it doesn't work out, it's still a need. Nothing really changes. But if it does work out, whew, you paid big at a spot you needed a big time upgrade at. Uh, let me get to uh, New Orleans. I'm going to do the same thing I did last week. I'm going to go Zach Zinter. It's just a plug and play right guard. Everything I've seen, the medical is going to check out before we get to the start of next year. So I see no reason to hesitate drafting him. And right guard's been a problem spot this year. And uh, Andrew Speed also makes a lot of money too. So chance to move on, free up some salary, draft Zach Zinter. He's been among the best guards in the Big Ten the last two years. So what's there to worry about other than that injury? But assuming he gets all the, the medical checks, don't, don't waste any time. Make this selection here if you're in New Orleans. To the Minnesota Vikings, uh, I think you can do a little bit better than a Caleb Evans. And TJ Tampa battle-tested there at Iowa State. 6'2", 200 pounds, long arms, plus-level athlete. Not special, but like plus-level, just above average. Uh, checks a lot of boxes. Man zone flexibility. I, I like a lot of what TJ Tampa brings to the floor. One of the higher floor guys, I think, out of those cornerback class. I mean, I have like special, special ceiling, like a Nate Wiggins maybe, but I think it has one of the higher floors of this group. Let me get to Atlanta 47. I'm going to go Jack Sawyer here. It's been a few weeks since we had Sawyer in a mock, and man, Awesome run defender, like an immediate, like honestly, better run defender than JT Tuamelo, which makes no sense because Tuamelo, Tuamelo's play strength at six foot four, two seventy, his arm, like, he should be an awesome run defender consistently. But again, inconsistency a major problem for him. Sawyer, man, got a nose for the football. They've even used him a couple times as a QB spy, which I just love that type of like. This is an athlete that can match some of the best players on this field. So let's just have him keep eyes on the quarterback so we don't lose in that way. Um, but also we've seen him start to turn a corner this year as a pass rusher. We're seeing that, you know, five-star athleticism fully put on display with a burst at the line of scrimmage. Needs to be coached up a little bit with the hand usage and teaching him a few more moves. But that I think, you, I think you're willing to do that here in the second round. Uh, take advantage of the athlete who's already a high-level run defender, can be used in a variety of different ways, move him over the field. I like this a lot. And it's just a little something different here to talk about with uh, Atlanta. And plus, he kind of brings the power where Arnold Ebichetti is kind of more that finesse rusher. So it's a nice compliment there on the edge. To the Pittsburgh Steelers at 48. Uh, a little something different I haven't done. But look, Mason Cole is bad. Mason Cole is just objectively bad. He's a good locker room guy, for sure. Don't get me wrong there. Jackson Paris Johnson would be the chance for the Steelers to find this, like, Pittsburgh's got a great track record of drafting centers, right? Mike Webster, uh, you know, Mar Marquise Pouncey, obviously, there right thereafter. Um and Jackson Powers Johnson to me is the top center in this class. And, you know, Pittsburgh's going to stick with the zone blocking scheme next year. We'll see what they do with the coaching staff and what changes may come with the blocking scheme. But they do stick in a typically zone blocking scheme. This is just the perfect, this is Tyler Lindebaum plus 25 pounds. You know, so I, I, I love this. I would love this as a Steelers fan. It's, a, it's not the sexiest of picks, but it's so much better than Mason Cole, who's literally some, some weeks having a hard time snapping it back to the quarterback, which, you know, sounds like rule one for a center, but it's been a point of concern. Um, also, you know, I think the Travis Frederick effect could be here for Jackson Paris Johnson, depending on where he goes. Like, 
Fredericks, you know, when he was at Dallas and, you know, when he was healthy, it's the best offensive line of football. He leaves for a year because of a scary injury. They go to just a pretty good offensive line. And then he comes back and they're the best offensive line all over again in football. Uh, you know, sometimes that missing center goes a long way and pieces everything together. Um, the alternative here is Pittsburgh could also draft a guard or sign a guard in free agency and just let James Daniels play center. I'd be, I'd be fine with that as well. To the Cincinnati Bengals here at 49. Uh, let's go with a little bit of a boring pick, Troy Fautano. Uh, I just, I'm assuming here, let's just go plug and play him at left guard. I, I don't think he's going to play tackle the next level because of his arm length. And left guard's been a problem spot all year long. Cordell Volson is just not the guy long term for Cincinnati. So Troy Fontano, we're going to get to see him against Texas. And now he holds up against that defensive line. I'm really excited to see that. But he was awesome in the Pac 12 championship game. No reason to think he won't be an awesome guard at the next level. To Houston, let's go Jalen Polk. You know, um, Robert Woods, I don't think it's a long-term answer. John Netsy III might be their slot of the future, but Tank Dell plays on the outside. I assume they bring back Nico Collins, at least I hope they do, because they found a great way to use him. And Nico Collins, if, if I'm him, I want to stay there because they found a great way to use me, and they're feeding me the football all I can. And then the yardage comes there after in that offense. Um, so Jalen Polk, it, it makes me think about Chris Godwin. He really does make me think about Chris Godwin. I watch him. 6'2", kind of has enough muscle and physicality to play over between the uh, between the hashes over the middle of the field. Um, great hands, variety uh, of routes that he can run, can attack over the middle of the field. He's also played like only 40% of his snaps from the slot. So I think he's a guy who can play outside, move him around, just like kind of Chris Godwin has throughout his career. But I think utilized best in the slot um, and you're got to have a situation. So Adding him to be that, you know, inside guy to Nico Collins and Tank Dell, big body, physical, over the middle, contested catch guy, the burner who does basically everything. Tank Dell, love that guy. And then Jalen Polk as kind of the Mr. Do Everything, a little Swiss Army knife, zone beater. You know, oh man, I would love to see this wide receiver room come to form if they were to slat, uh, select Jalen Polk here. All right, let's get on to Indianapolis. I'm going to go Xavier Worthy here. Um, this would be an interesting selection. I just was thinking about, hmm, you already have Jonathan Taylor and you already have Anthony Richardson. Who would be the next hardest guy to tackle here? Troy Franklin Franklin could definitely be the move here. I think I did that in last week's mock. So apologies that I can't remember that. But I think I did Troy Franklin last week as like an Alec Pierce upgrade. And Xavier Worthy would essentially be the same thing. Or like a, another swing of the bat at Paris Campbell, I guess. But I was just like, man, you know, it'd be really tough having to worry about those guys. And then also like the bubble out to Xavier Worthy with all that speed and open field ability. Like that would be an absolute headache. So I was just trying to think about like, who's another guy I don't want to tackle from this Colts offense. And Xavier Worthy kind of came to mind. Him or Troy Franklin, I'd be fine with here if you're a Colts fan. Uh, let me get to the Giants at 52. Let's go Chris Braswell. Um, I think Azizo Jalari can be okay when he plays, but honestly, making him just be like the early downs run stopper might be the move. Or just having him be the third guy rotating in whenever the other two need a breather. That's great. Braswell's been really impressive this year. Speed to power guy. Need to coach him up on everything else. Teach him a little bit more of those moves. Uh, but at least he has that one calling card. And he's been solid against the run too. Uh, so I think adding in Braswell here at 52, it's worth the swing of the bat. It's worth the at least at least adding the depth um, and getting a speed to power guy to compliment uh, Kayvon Thibodeau. And you know, Thibodeau's had a lot of like, finish the playoff sacks because Dexter Lawrence created the pressure and it's a quarterback rolling out left. Who's to say Braswell couldn't get some of that same production? But he's also a guy who just wins in a different way than Thibodeau. So, you know, Thibodeau with the bend, Braswell with the speed to power, Dexter Lawrence just causing havoc there in the middle. Really like that pass rush uh, outlook there for the Giants. This is where I'm going to have Troy Franklin come off the board. I'm going to have him go to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, you know, they've been pretty keen on getting the ball out of Trevor Lawrence's hand quick for the most part this season. Um, and I think the yards after the catch ability that Troy Franklin brings only assists in that, while also giving you a guy with a ton of long speed and an ideal, you know, you know, six foot three, may need to add a little bit of mass to be a consistent, you know, physical guy down the field, but at least he's got the speed to challenge over the top, plus he's, you know, six foot three, so those long strides come in handy as well. So another guy who can threaten over the top with Calvin Ridley, with Christian Kirk in that regard, but also a guy who can just give easy throws to on top of what you do with Christian Kirk. So um, just one other guy in the mix. And yeah, and some of the skill sets overlap with other guys in that room, but that's how you keep a defense on their toes. You don't know if the quick, easy, you know, yards after the catch play is designed for Kirk. You don't know if it's going to Franklin. So just trying to keep defense on their toes. And I think Jacksonville could use one more guy to play on the outside of receiver. To the Los Angeles Rams here at 54. I'm actually going to have them trade back out of this selection, which is totally a less neat thing to do. Like he trades down as much or more than anybody in the NFL draft just to stock up these day three picks. And hey, when, you know, back to back fifth rounders turn into Kyron Williams and Puka Nakua. Can you fault the man? No, you can not. Um, so I'm going to have Kansas City. Uh, unfortunately, I wrote down fifth here in my notes, but I don't see a fifth. So let's just make it two sixth instead. Oh, well, that's kind of the less neat thing. He wants quantity almost more than quality. He definitely wants both. But quantity is where this guy just, he really thrives. But anyways, Kingsley Suomate is going to be the pick here for Kansas City Chiefs. It's a one-year deal for Donovan Smith. I think you take the chance on the upside that is Suomate at six foot eight. His feet move way better than any, he has any business having them. Um, 
he struggles and he's not a great run blocker um and, and sometimes plays a little too tall a little too upright so there's things to to fix and to clean up there for sure but at the same time he's been a high graded pff pass protector at that size with the foot movement skills that he has it's at worth it's at least worth drafting him for that because He's likely to be a, a good pass protector to the next level and keep Patrick Mahomes clean. And then you kind of figure out the rest. So left tackle, long-term need for Kansas City. And I love Kingsley Suomati. I know I'm one of the higher guys on him. So, you know, maybe this is my bias kicking in. All right, at 55, I'm going to give Tampa Bay Kalen King. Um, you know, I know Antoine Whitfield has played some in the slot, but he hasn't played a majority of the snaps in the slot. And the guy who has, I think they can do better than. Um, and even if Kalen King doesn't play in the slot, which I think he should, kind of like Tyrion Arnold, I, I just think let's take advantage of that change of direction skills and play on the inside and take away easy throws and shifty receivers for an offense. If he, even if he does play on the outside, you know, I know they extended J- Jamel Dean and Carlson Davis, but those guys have both struggled this year. Like, it's been really disappointing as a guy who liked both those dudes coming out of college. I love them both, and they have struggled mightily. So Todd Bowles might need to change something up, put those guys in a better position to succeed, or they might just need someone else to kind of factor into that. Uh, but here, let's just say Kalen King plays in the slot. Antoine Winfield Jr., assuming they bring him back, is playing over the top in the box, playing some slot, you know, all that stuff. And then hopefully those guys on the outside have a bounce back season. All right, Buffalo then at 56. I'm going to go Tyler Newbin here. I mean, a mock draft with the Bills taking a safety. I know, shock and you're uh, a gaw here. But um, yeah, it's a long-term need because Pi. Uh, I just made them into one person. Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde cannot play forever. Um, so got to get younger at that position. Um, and, you know, DeMar Hamlin, great story, but he's played like, what, five games this year? So I, I don't know if it's the medical that they don't trust him to want to come back and play. Um, but also, as much as I love Taylor Rapp coming out of Washington, he's just a guy. He, he's a jag. You know, I think you can do better there um, or at least give him someone better to run with. Maybe that's DeMar Hamlin. Sounds like Christian Benford's a corner of the future. And they're going to kind of need him to. So, um, yeah, let's go corner here. Tyler Newbin, great center fielder there at Minnesota. And also, as the last line of defense, a very sure tackler. To the Rams at 57. Let's go Adisa Isaac, just a solid football player. And when you have a defense, I mean, look at Byron Murphy. Uh, Byron Murphy, God bless. Byron Young. Um, I don't think he's totally there as a pass rusher, but he's super explosive at the line of scrimmage and a very good run defender. And Aaron Donald kind of gives him a lot of cleanup sacks because, you know, quarterbacks are rolling out trying to avoid 99 and boom there's uh byron young and he's getting a lot of one-on-ones and when you're more athletic than the dude from across from you you win sometimes you know uh adisa isaac may not be that special of like an athlete but he just does everything really really well and with those other two guys in the play i could see him getting a lot of cleanup plays a lot of sack production because of it um and really here it's also to kind of bolster that run defense i think isaac could basically be a little bit of everything for the rams a guy who can win with some power can win with a little bit of finesse and bend but also just be a nice little run defend reinforcements and uh, with Donald and, and Young in the mix, guys who already do both those things really well, Aaron Donald brings a lot, a lot of the defensive attention, you know, from a pass rush standpoint, makes Young's life easier. I think you do the same thing for Isaac as well. To the Cleveland Browns, let's go Peyton Wilson here. Uh, another week where I'm giving the Browns an inside linebacker, but when you look at the roster, unless you can uh, just have Joe Flacco play quarterback forever, and as long as he is, I mean, God bless, there's not a whole lot of holes in this roster. You know, I thought about left tackle, maybe, you know, Jedrick Wills, you know, we'll see what ends up happening there long term. He hasn't been great as a first rounder. Um, so maybe tackle here, but uh, with Suomazi E off the board, I didn't I didn't love the value. Uh, you could go Kirin Omegaji from Yale. I think he's going to be a big time winner of the Senior Bowl, but I just didn't love it here, the value. So let's go Peyton Wilson. I mean, he was the best college, he was the best linebacker in college football this year. He, he just was. And he's had two years now of clean health, but he's also had a handful of shoulder and knee surgery. So it's definitely a scary proposition, but Taki Taki's been a pretty solid Sam. Jeremiah Wusukoromo, I think, is an awesome will linebacker. If Peyton Wilson can stay healthy and be a standout Mike, that is one of the best linebacking courts in football, and it just makes that defense that much more legit, which is hard to fathom and a little bit scary for me to think about as a Steelers fan. All right, we get to Dallas then at 59, and first we're actually going to have Dallas trade, and to be honest, it's because I didn't really want, I didn't know what to do here with Dallas other than something I've already done a handful of times, so let's change it up a little bit here for Cowboys. Um, I'm going to have Baltimore move up just a handful of spots, give up a fifth rounder. Boom, and I'm going to have Baltimore select Josh Newton. Do think they need a guy, uh, at least a younger piece in that secondary long term? Marlon Humphrey, Brandon Steens think those guys are pretty solid football players. Kyle Hamilton, they use all over. Can we just get one more corner in that room? Um, and then I feel a whole lot better about it. Typically, it's a, it's a roster that I don't see a whole lot of flaws with. Maybe a man coverage beater here. So if you want to go down that route, you know, maybe a Jermaine Burton. We'll see what he does in college football playoff. We're going to talk about him in just a couple of picks. But. Um, I think just adding Josh Newton, some additional depth, a little bit younger. Marlon Humphrey can't play forever. Brandon Stevens has been good this year. 
Is that Mike McDonald keeping him clean? You know, it's not bad to have an extra guy there waiting in the wings just in case. And then depending on what they want to do, Kyle Hamilton, it's just not a bad idea to have one more guy who can play outside if you need to move Marlon Humphrey into the slot. All right, let's get to Detroit here at pick 60. Let's go with Gabriel Murphy. I mean, they need someone else who can be a running mate with Aiden Hutchinson, uh, but someone who also plays bigger and has more mass and can play three downs, unlike uh, James Hudson. So, uh, Houston, excuse me, who, you know, with his weight and his size, to me, he's a DPR, which is awesome. Like, if he's if he's your designated passer specialist, you got him as a great value, obviously, as an undrafted guy. Um, and he'd probably thrive in that role because he's always fresh, you know. Uh, so I think Gabriel Murphy, a guy with three straight years of elite pass rush grades from PFF and a ton of production on top of it, falls in your lap here at 60, weighs 245 pounds. Yeah, I just I, I don't think you can pass on this here if you're Detroit. Then to Philadelphia, this one of Jermaine Burton come off the board. A guy with a ton of big playability, like an underrated deep threat. And man, like looking at what he's done this year, like he has grown a lot from when I initially looked at him thinking he might go into the draft two years ago. Like he's progressed a ton. The route running is much improved. The hands have gotten better. And he still has that big playability, that downfield speed. So underrated name. And we'll see what he does in the college football playoff. But don't be surprised if Jermaine Burton like balls out against Michigan and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, this was my draft sleeper. This was my draft sleeper. I'm thinking if he plays, if he has a big game against Michigan, you're going to see a whole lot of that. And to be that slot, third option as a receiver, fourth option really if you throw in Goddard, just makes that offense that much more potent in Philly. To Miami at 62. Come on, everybody. Stay with me. Jatavion Sanders, you are a Miami Dolphin. Athleticism checks the box there for Mike McDaniels. A plus level blocker, that checks the box. Plus, it's one more receiving threat you got to worry about. Plus Tyreek Hill, plus Jalen Waddle, plus those running backs. It's scary to think, it's scary to think about how this could improve this offense and make them that much more potent. But it's the one spot they don't really tap into. And I think Sanders gives Mike McDaniel everything he needs at that position that he didn't get out of Gasicki, and it's going to be as close as he gets to a uh, George Kittle type for this offense. To where picks go, San Francisco 49ers, we drafted a right tackle. Now let's go ahead and draft the uh, left guard. Christian Haynes played right guard only at UConn, but I think he make the flip to play left guard. Um, and Aaron Banks never made sense as a fit in that offensive line blocking scheme. He is much more of a gap you know, uh, scheme fit, which to the point, if San Francisco, uh, assuming they let him walk, if he goes to a gap blocking scheme, don't be surprised if Aaron Banks all of a sudden becomes a good football player. Um, and Christian Haynes is a very athletic interior offensive lineman. Yes, he plays at UConn. Doesn't have like the stiffest level of competition, but look at the tape. It's there. And at 315 pounds, actually plays pretty strong for that size, uh, but would just be an awesome fit for that zone blocking scheme and actually would fit that blocking scheme unlike Aaron Banks. And the last pick is going to be Chris Jenkins. Um, not to harp on it too much, but the Dallas defensive line hasn't been great. I know they just drafted a Michigan defensive tackle last year, Monty Smith. He's supposed to be their run stopper, but at this point he hasn't been. And at the worst, you have three interior defensive linemen for the future you're really happy about with Osa Digizua, Mozzie Smith, and Chris Jenkins. So you can rotate those guys all around, and trust me, you'll be able to make it work. But guys, that's going to do it for my updated two-round NFL mock draft with trades. Tell me what you think down below about the trades, who your favorite team is, did you like the prospects that gave your squad, who went too high, and who went too low. Love to hear all your thoughts on this mock draft down below in the comment section. As long as you're respectful, I will at least acknowledge the comment, heart it, react to it, or you know, more often than not, I respond to those comments when I have the time. So let me hear your thoughts. And if you don't like the picks I gave your squad, tell me who you would have gone with instead in those positions and maybe what position group you're really trying to target uh, in this upcoming NFL draft or even free agency for that matter. But guys, that's going to do it for me. Like, the, Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. Again, we're about 40 away from 3,000 subscribers. And uh, thank you all again for a great 2023 here on the channel. And uh, man, I'm so pumped up to see what 2024 has in store for us. So subscribe for sure, uh, for sure to BC. Uh, uh, to see everything we have to do as I uh, completely lose the ability to speak. But guys, that's going to do it for me. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach, and I'm signing off. <laughs>